Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord on this fourth Sunday in Advent. I'm coming to you from my office, obviously, uh, with the help of our tech wizard, Todd. Todd, say hello. Hello. <laughs> Todd is, uh, is helping me bring this, bring this message to our congregation and to anyone else who might want to uh, have a look in. Uh, I have to tell you, this, this feels really weird. Uh, there are a lot of things that feel strange in the world at the moment. Uh, this feels vaguely like uh, Todd and I have gotten together to film uh, a, uh, an episode of Wayne's World for local TV access or something. But uh, in fact, uh, anyone on the planet can see this. And so uh, from this point forward, I'll try to be as serious as I possibly can and uh, want to begin doing that by uh, opening this this time with prayer so join me please father we thank you for this day we thank you for the opportunity to come before you even as we are physically separated uh, to come together in spirit and in truth to worship and glorify you we do so in our separate homes wherever we may be and we come to give you praise that even in the midst of, uh, of a plague time, uh, even in the midst of the uh, chaos in the world, even in the midst of economic bad news, you are in the midst of us and you are sovereign. We don't know what the future holds for the world, for our country, for Anna, for our families or for ourselves. But we know that regardless of what happens, that you hold your people in the palm of your hand. And we thank you and we give over to you everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we hold dear, uh, that you might use it for your purposes and that your plans might be accomplished through us. We pray today for all who are coping with the virus or with other illnesses or injuries or any kind of physical difficulties or emotional difficulties or financial difficulties or familial difficulties. We pray for, uh, for victims of the virus. We pray for those who are treating them, that you would keep them safe. We pray for uh, their families uh, who may be really scared at the moment uh, over, over what's going on, and we ask you to be with them, to give them calm and trusting spirits. We pray for those who are experiencing unemployment uh, or have been laid off or are looking at reduced hours because of what's going on. We, uh, we pray for them. We pray for businesses that have been shut down as a result of this. We pray for all who are coping with, uh, with the, the financial fallout <clears throat> of this virus. And we pray that you would use our government, you would use the church, you would use one another to help those who are struggling to get through this time. We pray here in Anna, particularly for those of, uh, of our number uh, who are dealing uh, not with the virus, we haven't seen that yet in Union County, but uh, those who are dealing with, uh, with illness or with the after effects of surgery, we lift up uh, our members who have had surgery this week. We pray for their rapid recoveries and we pray that uh, you would keep them safe and free from COVID virus, uh, the COVID virus during, during this time. And we pray for parents uh, there are a lot of parents, not only here in Anna, but across the world, uh, who are dealing with shut down schools. They're dealing with bored children. They're dealing with having kids home, and they may not be. And uh, we ask that you would provide a way for each of them to handle their circumstances or to call upon others where, where possible 
to uh, help handle their circumstances with them, that the children of our country and our community and our world uh, may not be forgotten in the rush to deal with, with adult illnesses during this time, but that they uh, would be cared for, uh, that they may even be able to continue learning during this time. Father, as hard as this is to deal with for us personally, for our families, our community, our, our nation, and our world, we, uh, we ask that you would give us all trust in you, enable us to look to you as the ultimate source of healing, as the ultimate source of restoration, as the ultimate source of, uh, of all blessings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that you are God alone But sometimes I still try to take control I get scared when I can't see the end And all you want from me is to let go Your parting waters Making a way for me Your moving mountains That I don't even see You've answered my prayer Before No fear, you've not already seen. I rest my heart on all your promises. Cause I have seen and know your faithfulness. Your parting waters making. Gospel text for this fourth Sunday in Lent, the, uh, the text from the common lectionary used by, by uh, countless churches around the world, is oddly appropriate for the times that we're in. Uh, I'm going to focus on just a small part of it, but I'd like to read the whole of it. Uh, one never knows how one might benefit from hearing the Word of God in its entirety. And so the, uh, the Word comes to us today from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. 
And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a, is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how, how then does he see? His parents answered, We do know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believed, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see, and those who may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, 
Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a great deal in this story, uh, more than I can recount in the short time that I have this morning. But there is one thing in particular that I wanted to mention, and it's right at the beginning of the chapter. The man born blind was, uh, uh, was seen by Jesus' disciples. And as they saw him, <clears throat> and they must have known about him because they knew that he had been born blind. And so they asked Jesus a question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned? There's a real assumption behind this, and that assumption is one that was common, not only to Jews, but in fact to most people in the ancient world. And in fact, it's a belief that has not disappeared in our own. They believed that if something bad happened to someone, if they were born with a disability, or if they suffered a horrible accident, or if someone died who was close to them, or if they were stricken with a dread disease, that someone, either the individual himself or herself, or someone connected to him or her, must have in some way offended God, or in the case of the, the, uh, the pagans, the, the gods. Whichever it was, it didn't matter, because someone was to blame. Someone had done something wrong in order for this terrible thing to have happened. That's an assumption that many people continue to operate with now. You can hear that in the, in the words of, uh, of prosperity preachers who claim that when uh, something bad happens to you, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Or, for that matter, when something good that you prayed for doesn't happen, that you didn't have enough faith either. And as we all know, a lack of faith is sinful, and therefore they're accusing those of... Uh, 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 of whom they're speaking, of exactly the same kind of thing that the uh, disciples were accusing the man born blind. Uh, it may have been their parents, but it might well have been him. Imagine that. A man born blind. A man born blind. And they asked if he sinned. Now, of course, we all know we're all born with a four a fallen nature. All, all human beings are born, come into the world with a sinful nature, but that's not really what they're getting at. What they're getting at is, what did this man specifically do to offend God that this should have happened to him? It was not a fair question to ask of the man, and Jesus refutes it immediately. The very first words out of his mouth are, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. Sin was not what lay at the root of this man's distress. He had been born with a physical disability. Physical disabilities are not the result necessarily of any individual's personal sin. They're simply a sign that we live in a fallen world. We, we live in a world in which bad things happen, and frequently those are things that are not the direct result of our actions, but rather are the result of simply living in a world in which they're possible. That goes directly to the circumstances that we're dealing with now. There's a great deal of finger-pointing going on in the world. We want to know who is to blame for what is happening to us. There must be a person or there must be people who are at fault here. Now, I'm not saying that I know everything that happened in China. 
I don't know whether the government was competent or not, or not in the way that it dealt with the disease and when it first was discovered. Uh, it certainly seems as if, as if uh, the Chinese government was dishonest in some of what it told the world. But the people that we know here in America, the people around the world who are dealing with coronavirus now, the people who have died, didn't die because someone in China screwed up. They died because they caught a disease. Now that disease may have spread because of human action, but that disease ultimately is simply a force of nature. It's a force of this fallen world. And as such, going around wanting to point fingers and particularly, particularly to point fingers here serves no purpose at least not in dealing with the current crisis. Now, that's not to say that somewhere down the line there shouldn't be an accounting for government action, private industry action, business action, individual action. In order to learn from it, in order to improve, in order to be able to deal with a situation like this the next time it happens, and it will happen. It's happened throughout human history. It's it's simply a quirk of history that something like this hasn't happened sooner rather than, uh, rather than later. But the crucial point is that in dealing with natural disasters, and that's what a virus is, just as is a hurricane or an earthquake, in dealing with natural disasters, the question is not who, as, who is at fault. The question is, how do we deal with it? How do we keep people well? How do we make people well? How do we prevent future occurrences like this? And when things like this happen, as they inevitably will, how do we deal with them in the most effective way possible? There's a great blame game going on. It's going on in the press. It's going on among politicians. And quite frankly, it's tiresome and it's pointless. And ultimately, I think Jesus' answer to the disciples is one that we need to hear. It was not that this man sinned or his parents. Were mistakes made? I'm sure they were. Is someone to blame? I think not. Well, the interesting thing is that after answering that question, Jesus goes on to tell them something they didn't ask about. And as much as anything, this is what we need to hear this morning. He says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. What is it that enables us to see? Light. Not simply the healing of blindness, but the light that surrounds us. That is what enables us to see. And that light has its ultimate source in the one who is light, the light of the world, even Jesus Christ, the son of the God of Abraham. There were things that he had to do. There were ways that he had to speak. There were actions that he needed to take in order to demonstrate to the world that he was indeed the Son of God, that he was indeed the light of the world, and this was one of them. He's not saying that God caused this man to be born blind in order that Jesus could heal him. His blindness was the result of the fallenness of the world. But that doesn't mean that God could not use that for good, and in fact did use it for good, used it for an evangelistic, evangelical purpose. At the end of the story, after Jesus has given this man his sight back, after he's taken the opportunity 
to, to, after the man has been given the opportunity to testify to what Jesus has done to change his life, Jesus comes to him and asks, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man asks him, well, who is that? And Jesus essentially says, it's the one who healed you. And his response is, I believe. And he worshiped him. He acknowledged him to being God in the flesh. He would not have known terms like incarnation. He certainly would have had no thought for the Trinity. But he recognized that God was at work in this man who was before him. And in the process, this man had changed his life and had given him access to light, the light of the world that he had never had before. So instead of blame, instead of going out and looking who to point the finger to for what's going on right now, let's instead cure disease. Let's prevent disease. Let's do what is needed to keep people safe. And let us look to the light of the world, because even in the midst of dark times, he is present and at work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world, that through him the world may be saved. Even as we've prayed earlier for you to be at work, uh, healing work, protecting work, saving work in the midst of COVID-19, we pray that in the midst of a fallen world where darkness reigns, that the light that is your Son would go forth, would illumine every dark corner, and would bring to the light all those whom even now you are calling into your kingdom. Father, we ask this for the sake of the world and in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me this morning, uh, this afternoon, whenever it is that you happen to see this message. I hope it has been a, a blessing to you. And may God bless you and bless our world. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. 